the land and the water here was a way of life. Everybody on St. Helena depended on it. You were a farmer or a fisherman. The people that farm share with the fishermen. The fishermen share with the farmer. That, that's, that was the way of life. St. Helena Island is a magical place on the South Carolina coastline where African American men and women have farmed this land and fished this water for centuries, first as plantation slaves and then as freedmen. It's now one of the last communities on the East Coast that hasn't been swallowed up by development and tourism. But St. Helena's way of life is at a crossroads. Denise and I have spent the last year on the island to see how farmers and fishermen have adapted to the modern world. We wanted to see if they could pass their heritage on to another generation, or if the treasures of the land and the water here would be lost forever. We met James Bradley on his family land which sits on a deep creek with easy access to the ocean. I'm a commercial fisherman. I've been doing this for 52 years. I think the best shrimp in the, in the world is shrimp that we catch in from here to Florida with the boat. We boat come in and go out there this morning bringing fresh catch right out the, out the ocean as best you can find. My family was right here. My wife grew up right Chuck Henry was born way up north, but he bought a thousand acres on the island and now owns one of the few large farms here. Came to this piece of sand, second day of February, 1947. Set out to see if I could uh, run a farm to pay the bills and make it better. There's never been less than three people worked here. I've had as much as 200 people working on the place. I've had an awful lot of people in those 65 years. A lot of people. Ben Johnson grew up on the island and like many others, moved north to pursue a career in industry. But after he retired, he ended up right back on the family farm. I can trace my family back to slavery. And I lived here for the first 17 years of my life. We grew up everything we ate. Very little we had to go to the store and buy. I had to milk a cow every morning, every day of my life. And when I left South Carolina, I said two things I was going to do, drink milk and go to church because those are the things I had to do. I didn't have a choice. When I retired, I went back to the thing I hated most, farming. I farm about 30 acres. I have cows on it. Um, I grow sweet potato, all the vegetables. I came across my great-grandfather's deed in the courthouse, which was 1892. He purchased 20 acres of land, 30 or 40 years after they got out of slavery. Um, and we've been farming. My great-grandfather farmed it. My mother farmed it. Um, and now I'm farming it. So, and hopefully I can pass it on to the next generation. 
When we first met Sarah Reynolds Green, it was on her family land. Her husband Bill cooks up most of their produce at his restaurant, the Gullah Grub. Things that grow by the sun and grow by nature, it get a natural flavor and it tastes so much different. The thing about it, Gullah style cooking is, you, you got to be able to use all your sense. You got five cents, most of the time, by the time you finish, you don't use them all. <laughs> After the smoke cleared from the Civil War, people continued farming and fishing using the practices passed down from their slave ancestors. Up and down the Atlantic coast, these isolated pockets developed their own culture and way of life. They became known as the Gullah people. To the mainlanders, they were known as the Geechee people. St. Helena was a very connected community. Everybody did, and pretty much still does, know everybody else. They, they were just industrious, self-sustaining people. It was such a pleasure back in, in those days. I can remember, and it came to me the other day, my father, he had a mule and a plow, and as a child, I would sit on the middle of the plow as he was plowing the field. And I could see it now, the soil, just moving and moving. And I'm sitting right in the middle of that plow while he's plowing down the rows. Straight rows. <laughs> I never realized how good it was until I left. Because um, you had everything here, everything you needed here. You could go come, come down here and cast, get shrimp and they could walk down there and get all the oysters you need. It's, it was a good life down here. I just found that out after I came back. Uh, they used to go out, come back with a boatload of mullet fish. Mullet fish, mullet fish, man. Oh, mullet fish, five cents a pound. Mullet fish, everybody bring your pan. Everybody come through, everybody got a pan. Five cents a pound. And they shared all around. You know, everybody had enough to eat, you know. Land ownership was also traditional. Emancipated slaves rarely kept a will, and they passed their land on to all surviving family members in a system known as heirs' property. Family members owned the land together and shared in both the benefits and the responsibilities of ownership. This system kept the people connected to the land and to one another. It was a good thing a hundred years ago because um, it kept the land in the family. One would plant something and the other would plant something different and the harvest season, everybody would have part of what everybody else harvests and if they could sell, then the person who could have them would sell. But as time changed, some families lost control of their land. As the family grew and people go away, and a lot of times it leaves the burden of the family member that either farm in it or live on it to pay the taxes and everything. And the larger the family gets, the more people get involved. What a developer can do is try to get one or two people to sell their portion. If you got a hundred people, and you only have five acres of land, you can't split the land, but you can split the money. And the bad thing about that, it sells to a disinterested party. And that's why a lot of land got away. I've seen, I've seen a lot of changes. I've seen too much changes, really. Explain that, what have you seen? Well, developments going into uh, areas that I know when I first went to work for Beaver County, it was a lot of that land on Hill and Head was growing tomatoes. It was tomatoes planted over there. And uh, it's just gone, you know. It's hard to believe that Hilton Head Island is just 15 miles away by boat. 
50 years ago it was covered by small family farms, but now it hosts some of the most exclusive resorts and golf courses in the state. Our land is worth more being on deep water to the economy as far as building houses and uh, condominiums and things. More people are realizing they like to live on the coast. You put it out, people can put a big house up there, knock those trees out the way. You got a view in over the ocean, that, and man, people will give a million dollars for it. A lot of shrimpers, they know nothing but shrimping. And uh, it is a tradition, it's a way of life, and it's being lost. But I wish I could say it will be him forever, but with the economy like it is, and the cost of everything is dwindling out. You know, um, the developments on Hilton Head and Fripp and all the other islands, it's, it saddens me because, you know, I, I look at what was and now you don't have that kind of sense of um, home like home, like your home has been um, renovated in a sense, and you didn't have much to say about it. The bottom line is that profits are low and property prices are high. In recent years, this perfect storm has pushed locals to sell the land that was in their family since reconstruction. Now, the Gullah Geechee folk of St. Helena are some of the last holdouts against this tide. Other forces the islanders faced were the tectonic shifts in both the fishing and the agricultural markets. The younger people, uh, you know, uh, start going to school, they start going off. They didn't work to farm. All the fruit and vegetables they used to grow, uh, they don't grow it no more, they come from somewhere. See the growing shrimp in the pond and send them to America, America buying it cheap and the, uh, it's put the board, just put the board of the business doing that. In uh, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, almost every landowner on St. Helena Island would grow a small patch of tomatoes, maybe a, 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 just a couple tenths of acre or something or other. They could take it to any one of four different outfits in the nearby area who would buy it from them at a reasonable market price, grade it, pack it, and sell it. Uh, that can't be done now. That's sort of disappointing, but that's the way it is. St. Helena's residents were not about to give in, however. The people saw what was happening to Hilton Head, Dartor, Fripp Island, and then they had a, another little island they came in wanted to develop right off Eddings Point. They wanted to run a road through a lady's yard. And that sparked the protest. And then back then it was, we don't want development on this island. We don't want it to move that fast. The Penn Center, originally started as the Penn School after the Civil War, became a rallying point for St. Helenans to organize and make their voice heard. In 1999, the Beaufort County Zoning Ordinance delineated St. Helena as a cultural protection overlay district. That's a special status that puts strict limits on development on the island. It was a multiracial event. Everybody was interested in it because most people moved to St. Helena, moved for the laid backness we have. We can't really stop development, but the idea was to slow it down at a pace where wouldn't encourage developers to come. The first thing you don't see, you don't see a whole bunch of stoplights. No golf courses, no big signs and all of that. But the overlay program, it's one of the best things that could happen in Santa Helena. 
This island sustained us for so many years. And as development continues and grows, that sustainability is being compromised. That's what I don't understand. How do you destroy the thing that drew you to this beautiful place? And if they can get that point, then we can live in harmony with one another because we both treasure the same thing. Over the last few decades, many outsiders have come to see the importance of preserving Gullah culture. Other organizations are joining in this effort. The Natural Resources Conservation Service, or the NRCS, is a group like this. They work with private landowners to ensure healthy soils and clean water, especially in agricultural areas. Diane Leone is a conservationist who has worked on St. Helena for years. She has a passion for the place. Coming to St. Helena is like going back in time. I think it's what every person comes back to in their life, even for me personally. I worked on a farm when I was younger, and to see people come back and, and work the land, I have a connection to, and I have a connection to that small farming concept. NRCS has a partnership with the Penn Center, the Beaufort County Open Land Trust, the Beaufort Conservation District, on um, an effort to preserve prime agricultural land on St. Helena. Chuck Henry, he has made a huge decision to take a good chunk of his property and put it in land preservation or a conservation easement forever. I really admire him for that conservation ethic because people say, oh, they want to do the right thing or they want to recycle, but this man really did what he said he wanted to do. I got people coming out here and hanging up their easels to paint pictures and so forth, and I get to live there. Good grief, girl. You can't beat that with a stick. And so, uh, hopefully, uh, these same children and grandchildren of mine will be able to look at it the same way for some years to come. With the conservation easement, Mr. Henry has basically committed his land to agriculture in perpetuity, and that's forever. It will never be used for hotels or mansions. What I'd ideally like to see on St. Helena is preservation of farmland, but more importantly, the preservation of the small family farm. We've preserved large acreage, and the piece of the puzzle is now the smaller acreage which usually is heirs' property. They're usually smaller pieces of land, but they're just as valuable as a 200-acre piece of land. I think working with heirs' property is challenging, but I think it's doable. It's just working through those challenges. There could be over 19 members of the family that own the property, and they need one spokesperson, one decision maker on behalf of those 19 family members. I'm optimistic that we can work through it. It would just, it would just take time. Another NRCS effort goes by the name of EQIP. This is a cost sharing program that helps landowners install conservation practices that improve their farm's productivity and environmental performance. Sarah is a great spokesperson for education and for organic farming and being close to the land. This system in, it's been a lifesaver throughout the summer because it's been so dry and we were trying, we were trying to work with the forces of nature and Yah and his graces and giving us the water, but it just wasn't coming. So we had to have these drip tape throughout the field all summer long, keeping the plants um, saturated with water. And it's good because it goes directly to the plant. It doesn't water the, the alleys and all the other areas in the grass. So it's been a lifesaver and I thank them so much for having that program available to um, small farmers, you know. Ben Johnson has a really good conservation ethic. He was hesitant at first to getting involved in cost share programs. 
But now that he's tried it, he's convinced and he knows it can work and it worked great for him. This fence came about through NRCS and getting involved in NRCS was one of the best things happened to me since I was farming. It came about through Penn Center. Really, it wasn't for Penn Center, I would never got involved in it. When we first started, you have to be the 75 feet boundary, you know. I said, man, I'm wasting all that land. But then I understood why it's, it was necessary and it's a really good thing, a really good thing. We don't want, don't want to have runoffs in the creek, in the water, because we go out there and get crab. I can throw a crab trap out behind my farm over there and uh, go, back, go back maybe a day later and I got 20 or 30 crabs in it. And I have to eat that crab. So I'm not really, you know, I'm looking out for the environment, but I'm looking out for myself too. And I, I wouldn't want nobody to have a runoff in there. The cost sharing plan, they, they supply 75% of the money. And it was a good cost sharing plan. You had to do a lot of the work yourself, but it was worth it. For this community to thrive, it needs to have young people who want to stay on the island and who know how to make a living off the land. Hi, my name is Janice. Hi, my name is Carolyn. My name is Kalila. My name is Zaria S. Green. I'm Brandon and I'm 13. I'm Jordan and I'm 11. I'm 12. I, I hear the young people talk about leaving and they can't wait till they get, to get out of here. You think you're going to stay here forever? No, I'm moving to Atlanta. I want to go. I want to go. I want to move out of state. Why is that? I don't know. I just don't like it that much down here. Hmm. What do you not like about it? I don't like it so small. It reminds me of what I was saying. We always said, why would you want to live at the, on the end of the world? At the end, you know, it seems like this was the end of the world because there was one way in and one way out. When it was time for me to leave, I was glad to get out of here. But I keep saying if they knew what I know now, they wouldn't say that. Because to me, this is the best place to be. All right. All right, we're gonna have a couple crews. All right, the thinners. Come on, let's go. Thinners, the ones that are going thin the, uh, come on and we'll thin the kale. This is kale here. The Greens are using their businesses to teach young people about entrepreneurship in farming, making food, and selling food. In working with the young, the young kids, that's what I think a lot of our kids are missing, that experience of being on a farm, growing things, and being around people that love it. And they can tell I love working, coming out and working on, on the farm. Well, we could do a dinner for them. That sounds like a great idea. Like most people look at hard work, that's slavery. You know, who wants to work in the farm? That's slave work. And that's the mentality of not only the young kids, but some of the old people as well. Who want to go back to slavery, you know, working on a farm? And so once we educate them that this is not slavery, this is entrepreneurship, creativity, teaching you to be self-sustaining to be able to take care of your family. You have to do it in order to get that kind of uh, euphoric feeling. Looking good back there, guys. Especially when a, a young child that you've been working with come to you and say, oh, Miss Green, we going to the farm today? And I'll say, no, I can't do it again. Oh, come on, maybe we can go for a little while. That is the most important. I mean, that makes your day. When a young child wants to come and work with me, it sort of heightens my um, understanding of this, this, this is really working. All right, Zaria, you're going to drop? Each landowner has had to find their own pathway to sustainability on the island. About 40 years ago, we decided to get our own business. At that time, we could have mortgaged the property by the boat. 
we were able to buy our own boat and put up our own seafood market. And I was running a boat, our own operator, boat captain, and run the boat. Me and my son and my wife run the seafood market. And we've been doing pretty good, making ends meet, doing that. If I have a big catch, like my catch, four or five hundred pounds, I take about two hundred pounds in the retail market and take three or four hundred pounds to someone who can buy a whole lot. You know, we don't retail but a small amount. When we started the farm as an organic farm, we were trying to find out the best way to market what we grew. I'm working full-time, my husband's working full-time, and the kids are in school. So we didn't want to go the avenue of taking it to a farmer's market. So I went to a seminar, and they were talking about this thing called CSAs. It's called Community Supported Agriculture. And what that involves is you get shareholders to buy into your farm, and you grow for those shareholders. That was a perfect match for us. So during the summer, Wednesday, all the kids will just converge on the farm and some of the shareholders, and we pick everything that's ready to be harvested. And then we package it up and take it down right behind the Gullah Grub. There's a little shed there. So the shareholders just come and they go with bags of vegetables every week. And they are so happy because they get to know where their food is coming from, who is growing their food, and the quality is out of this world. Ben Johnson's strategy is quite simple. All the my truck farm and all my vegetables, I don't have to go anywhere to, to people come to me. Um, they, they get word of mouth and they'll call. In fact, I got two calls on the phone this morning. I have to go home and listen to the answering machine, but they either want pigs or sweet potato. For me to market is not a hard job because all I have to let people know I have it. Ben passes his traditions on to future generations by giving his grandchildren a good taste of farm life. Brand, Brandon, yeah. get back on the truck. Push that whole bundle that way. There you go. Push it some more. Okay, we got through cutting the sugar cane, and while I was cutting it, my grandchildren were stripping it uh, to put it on the truck so we wouldn't make a mess at Penn when we get there tomorrow. Well, why they are working, because all the money they make, all the money off the sugar cane goes to them. This is a part of bringing them down to the farm and letting them know how I grow things and to take it to the market. How many, Brandon? It ends right there. Goes to the world if we go to the Brandon. sprinkler. Goes sprinkler. We do this every year, uh, every year for the last, I guess, 10 or 15 years, and this is their fifth or sixth year being involved with cutting sugar cane and putting it on the truck and selling it. Tomorrow, their mother and father and their granny will ch they'll sell the sugar cane tomorrow. Heritage Day and the parade. It's hard to put in words. You can't, you can't really describe heritage. It's a, it's a feeling, it's a way of life. It's something embedded in you that comes out when, when you start to march from St. Helena Elementary School and to come to Penn Center and you get involved with the people there. It's an awesome feeling. You just can't put it in words, you know, how you feel. Every year, thousands of people converge on St. Helena Island for Heritage Days. How are you doing? My whole family got involved with. They're out there, they're, they're, they're just like being out there with the people. Oh, there you go. I've been a now. 
I'm a school teacher. I can count now. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Praise him. That's great. You made it. I'm going to get where you are one day. I will. I will. Every yes, family on the island just wonderful. about is touched doing heritage. That means you have a relative or family or a friend that came from wherever they have gone to. They have escaped the island, they have gone somewhere else, and now they're coming back for heritage. For those coming home, Heritage Days is about the nostalgia of their youth. But this is not just a reenactment of the good old days. This is where the people bring out the best of the year's harvest and catch from the sea. Here in St. Helena, they must be doing something right. It's going to take everyone's efforts to make the island viable and it lies in the hearts of the farmers and the fishermen. My relationship with the land is something that would be incomprehensible to a sane person. Uh, they, they just they couldn't grasp to, to me the land and the, the fruits that spring from it are <laughs> I sound like some novelist or something, but they're part of me. I, I love it. Ben Johnson will continue by keeping the best traditions and adding the conservation methods that improve upon his ancestors' ways. I have lived all over the world, and I had never found a place that I love as much as I love St. Helena. I love as much as I love down to my farm. Talk to Sarah for a while and you'll soon find out who was most influential in her life. My mom, I mean, she was an uh, entrepreneur to her heart and my, my brothers and those are always used to say, boy, if she was a lawyer or a doctor, man, we would have been millionaires, but she went into farming. I said, but we're still millionaires in a sense that everybody knew that whatever she grew, it was beautiful. That's what I want to do. I want to hold on to the land and what, I got some grandchildren coming up, my wife and I mean my daughter and her children. I hope they'll uh, to get interested in it, you know, to keep it and put something on it. And uh, if the land ain't going no way. We have so much notoriety now about our Gullah Geechee Corridor and how sacred this place is. But we have to embrace that it's sacred and we have to know when things are sacred, you take care of it, you maintain it, and you preserve the way of life that it is. If we incorporate the kids in as many opportunities in our culture as possible, there is no other way but it can be a better place.